Amadeo Bordiga, 1889-1970, by Pietro Basso. The imposing figure of Amadeo Bordiga passes through two completely different periods of both 20th century and communist movement history. The leader of the Communist Party of Italy and an influential member of the Third International, Bordiga was center stage in the period starting with the great carnage of World War I and culminating in the revolutionary cycle triggered by the October Revolution. An even more devastating world war inaugurated the second period of Bordiga's activity, a time characterized by a strong and sustained capitalist development. Bordiga had a marginal political role then, but he carried out a deep and original reconstruction of Marxist revolutionary thought, albeit still little known or very much misinterpreted by bitterly hostile Stalinists. Bordiga's work made its mark on the 20th century and communist movement history. The fight against reformism, 1911 to 1920. Bordiga was born on the 13th of June, 1889, in Racina, near Naples, from a half-aristocratic and half-bourgeois family. Bordiga was only 21 years old. Bordiga was only a 21 years old engineering student when Bordiga joined the Italian Socialist Party, founded in 1892. The context of his early political education was marked by a fundamental contradiction. Naples, just like the rest of Italy, was experiencing a state-supported swift industrialization leading to the growth of a politically involved new proletariat. But a sub-reformist leadership was affecting Neapolitan socialism, an extreme version of, nas of a national phenomenon. The local leadership dedicated themselves to electoral plotting, with anti-socialist forces, and their Freemason partners supported imperialist materialism. Mil Jesus Christ, imperialist militarism. Because of this contradiction, Bordiga and a few other comrades quit the local PSI federation and found the Carlo Marx Revolutionary Socialist Circle on the 2nd of April 1912. They studied Marxist thought while campaigning among industrial workers. They also took part in the elections, putting forward militant candidates who were devoted to the socialist cause and rejected any compromise with bourgeois parties. The Carlo Marx Circle dissolved only two years later, but not before obtaining the dissolution of the Naples Federation from the 1914 PSI Congress in Ancona, as well as a declaration of incompatibility between socialism and Freemasonry. The circle of Naples Marxists, led by Bordiga, got thus to be acknowledged across the country for both its theoretical force and political intransigence, and became a model to the Youth Socialist Federation. Bordiga's relationship with the PSI at the national level was equally complicated. Beginning the beginning of the 20th century, saw some influential figures like Turati, Trevis, Kolishkiov, and Bisalati shape a clear reformist agenda. Despite essentially sharing Bernstein's views, the PSI reformists kept referring to socialism as the goal, however remote, of their actions. But what they actually meant by socialism was the widening of democracy, within the limits of existing institutions. The class struggle was regarded as a law-abiding, peaceful way of boosting this evolutionary process, with elections being the key events. The young Bordiga rejected this view, but he remained for a decade in the PSI, as its rank and file included the most militant factory and farm workers. Following the 1911 Italo-Turkish War over Libya, an intransigent tendency appeared within the PSI, 
with Bordiga playing an active role in it. Bordiga's tireless contribution proved crucial, eventually leading some years later to the programmatic and political foundation of the PSI Communist Abstentionist Fraction. Their targets were both reformism and the maximalist tendency by Giacinto Menotti Serrati, which was crucial, critical of reformism and yet unable to separate from it. During this fight, Bordiga anchored his, critic, his approach in the principles of Marxist communism. His internationalist conception of the class struggle was based on a constant monitoring of the international labor movement. In response to the collapse of the Second International at the outbreak of the First World War, Bordiga was to be among the first to call for a completely new international organization. The political struggle that forged an Italian communist left fed itself off both the proletarian opposition to Italy joining World War I and the Red Week of 1914, June 1914, and the Biennio Rosso of 1919 to 20, the widespread working class unrest at the end of the First World War that made Italian society teeter on the brink of insurrection. During those years, Bordiga and his comrades faced the sudden about turn of the Avanti chief editor, Benito Mussolini, who shifted his support from neutralism to interventionism in October 1914. They stuck resolutely to the revolutionary defeatism, even in the harsh atmosphere when Italy seemed to face military defeat in autumn 1917. They then opposed the law-abiding conciliatory corporatist agenda set out by union leaders and PSI MPs. The party, they claimed, came before unionism or parliamentary groups, and it had to foster social conflict with a view to preparing a socialist revolution, which alone can free the proletariat from class oppression. Bordiga's group therefore welcomed the Russian Revolution and spread its message. According to Bordiga, quote, the revolution has dealt a mighty blow to the nationalist conception of war. The war. End quote. Because by crushing their militarism, own militism, ugh. because by crushing their own militarism, the Russian proletarians have set an example and encouraged German proletarians to follow in their steps. Moreover, quote, while well, everybody was leaving it for dead, end quote, socialism had proved to be very much alive. On the 20th of February 1918, Bordiga wrote that from, quote, Free Russia, where a double revolution had occurred, socialism was delivering an international message that concerns the capitalist order at, a, at world level. Quote, the international social re revolution is on the agenda of history, end quote, Bordiga. The struggle against reformism came to a climax that shook up the PSI. Reflecting the popularity of Soviet, of Soviet power among the working classes, the party chose to join the Third International in 1919. The communist fraction and Bordiga wrongly believed that they could get the PSI maximalist majority to cut the umbilical cord with the reformists. In Bordiga's view, the Bolsheviks had won thanks to their intransigence towards both bourgeois parties and socialist fractions, and that was a model to follow. But the majority of the PSI were reluctant to burn their bridges with reformists. They were struck with uncertainty in the face of that historical turning point. There is some evidence contradicting the common belief that Bordiga was doctrinaire, sectarian, and distant from the workers' feelings. First, Bordiga knew that his group was bound to split from the PSI and yet spared no effort to make Serrati's maximalists come over to his side while actively tightening links with militant parliamentarians, including rural workers. Second, Bordiga was convinced that taking part in elections collided with preparing a revolution, and yet he accepted the Third International's policy of rejecting abstentionism. Third, Bordiga believed that the Turin group Ordine Novo, led by Antonio Gramsci, was workerist and idealist in nature and yet worked to have them participate in the foundation of the new Communist Party. 
Bordiga and the, the Italian Communist Party and the Third International, 1921 to 26. The new party was eventually born in Livorno in January 1921. As Bordiga pointed out, it was born late. That is to say, after the revolutionary process reached its peak in Russia and Europe. As for Italy, by the time of the PCI, oh, as for Italy, by the time the PCI saw the light of day, class struggle was falling away while the fascist movement was growing stronger and stronger and was about to crush the newborn party. However, the PCI was not insignificant at all as a political force. It boasted over 42,000 members in 1921, most of whom were maximalist left-wing proletarians who streamed into the PSI during the 1919-20 period. During the succeeding years of gathering reaction, 1921-23, Bordiga's energetic leadership worked to turn his party's rank and file into a cohesive and centralized organization that rejected all personal scheming and groupism and proved able to defend itself physically from fascism's assaults. Another remarkable feature of the Bordiga-led PCI was its active and critical participation in the Third International, which Lenin personally encouraged. No other West European Communist Party asked so resolutely that the International actually led the revolutionary struggle of the working no other Western European Communist Party asked so resolutely that the International actually led the revolutionary struggle of the working class across all Europe countries. However, it was in this troubled relationship with the Third International leadership that the young Italian left showed its weaknesses. Its approach was firmly anchored in Marxist principles and yet failed properly to inspire the actual political action of the party. The Italian left communists did not have an in-depth understanding of how worker struggles were developing, which translated into a somewhat crude use of tactics. The same applies to their theoretical and practical approach to the question of the common turn tactic of the, quote, united front with the social democratic parties, which they interpreted only as, quote, unity in the trade unions, end quote, without any, quote, political united front, end quote. This, quote, rigid approach however, stem from the vital need of the newborn Communist Party to disentangle itself from maximalist mishmash, mishmash, systematically watering down revolutionary principles and practice. The PCI leaders had rapidly to provide political training to young militants who had just turned to the Communist perspective. Similarly, they displayed a, quote, rigid attitude toward international politics, fearing that Moscow's excessive tactical flexibility would harm the third international strategy and the basic principles as eventually happened. 1923 was Bordigas and his comrades Annas Terribilis. Terribilis. Annas Terribilis. <laughs> Whatever. Fuck it. <laughs> The fascist, quote, witch hunt of communists started, and Bordiga spent most of the year in prison. This is also when the International dissolved the PCI's executive committee in a coup de force, accusing it of fatally hindering fusion with the PSI. While the Mussolini regime was suppressing the party's press, state repression, political firings, rocketing unemployment, and fascist aggressions were wiping out the PCI's proletarian ranks. In this context, a three-year tense confrontation began between Bordiga and both Moscow and the new Gramsci-led PCI leadership. The latter eventually prevailed and marginalized Bordiga. The Lyon Congress of January 1926 brought about an almost complete refoundation of the PCI. At the, fo at the following and large plenum of the Common Turns Executive Committee, ECCI, February 1926, Bordiga alone stood up to the overall common turn policy, driven by the principle of, quote, socialism in one country. At the time of the Lyon Congress, the working class movement and the left wing of the international were losing ground dramatically. 
the whole European proletariat had already been defeated, despite its valiant efforts in Hungary, Germany, Italy, and Bulgaria. In Moscow, Stalin and Bukharin had already prevailed over the, quote, united opposition of Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Trotsky. In Lyon, the new centrist PCI majority made some heavy accusations against Bordiga's leadership, which they argued failed to prevent the victory of fascism because of their sectarian view and the refusal of the, quote, united front. Bordiga's leadership was then blamed for being unable to analyze real social facts and power relations between the classes. Allegedly, it could not tell a reactionary situation from a democratic one and took a pedagogical and propagandistic approach to political action. Bordiga's seven-hour speech in reply was equally robust. The new leadership's, quote, opportunist course, he argued, was, quote, poisoning the party, paving the way to its, quote, disintegration and degeneration, end quote. The leadership refused to realize that the democratic bourgeoisie helped bring fascism into power. They shirked the leadership responsibility of the party by following proletarians' temporarily low mood. They addressed all rural producers indiscriminately. Instead of talking to farm laborers first, they subjected the minority to a humiliating discipline. At the sixth and large plenum of the ECCI in Moscow, Bordiga was even more marginalized and once again responded with what E.H. Carr called a powerful though solitary assault on the triumphant Stalinist reader leadership of the Russian party and the Third International. Bordiga addressed them with a fundamental question of principle with crucial political practical consequences. Who is entitled to talk and make decisions about the perspectives of socialism in Russia? The Russian party alone or the whole international? Only a few days before the Bolshevik leadership had requested that other delegates should not raise the Russian question. Bordiga had a memorable verbal crossfire with Stalin during the meeting with the Italian delegates and gave an equally memorable speech at the ECCI's plenum. He asked Stalin some awkward questions about the workers' opposition in Leningrad, the concessions to middle-class peasants, the campaign against Trotsky and Stalin's disagreement with Lenin over crucial issues. To top it off, Bordiga asked the Russian leader what would happen in Russia if no revolution broke out in Europe for some time. To Bordiga, Russian issues were not inherently Russian. They were the business of the international communist movement instead. Consequently, the international as a whole should have made decisions about these issues. Bordiga's 23rd of February speech at the ECCI's plenum expanded on this point, as he now criticized the entire international's politics as well as its role in the Russian party. He argued, quote, The great experience of the Russian party is invaluable indeed, and yet we need something more besides. End quote. That is, the knowledge of the conditions for, quote, demolishing the capitalist liberal and parliamentary state, end quote, in advanced countries, since the modern democratic state can defend itself better than the authoritarian states, and is far more effective in making proletarians turn to opportunism. Defeating such a strong experienced enemy as the European democratic bourgeoisies requires more than the mere existence of communist parties, which Bordiga argued had then to, quote, rally huge masses around them, end quote. In sum, while agreeing on the theses of the communist third commun uh, in sum, while agreeing on the theses of the third common turn Congress in 1921, that had mapped out a strategy based on using the unified front tactic, Bordiga rejected their tactical applications because they harmed the, quote, specific nature of communist parties, thereby weakening their capacity of conquering the masses. Bordiga also criticized the influence affecting decision-making in Russia of middle-class peasants and netmen exploiting the new market mechanisms introduced in 1921 
and claimed that all Comintern sections should take part in the debate over the future of the Russian Revolution, also on account of the growing pressure of world capitalism against it. Bordiga, therefore, condemned the Bolshevization of the Communist parties as a pretentious attempt to replant the Russian model everywhere. Bordiga also criticized the underlying idea that there was such a thing as an organizational formula for, quote, solving the problems of revolution. Finally, in Bordiga's opinion, both the appearance of factions within the common turn and the mounting insubordination against it were not the cause, but rather the symptom of severe crisis, and the common turns resorting to humiliation and violence, a true and not in the least revolutionary reign of terror, would only make things worse. After 1945, against both state Marxism and financial thermonuclear imperialism. On the 20th of November 1926, Bordiga was arrested and placed in confinement in Ustica with dozens of other PCI members, including Gramsci. Gramsci. I can never pronounce his name, Gramsci. He was then transferred for some time, months to Palermo prison to be eventually put back in confinement in Panza until 1929. In March 1930, Bordiga was expelled from the party for its, for, quote, factionalism and for, quote, supporting, defending, and embracing the Trotskyist opposition, end quote. In 1937, the communist leader Palmiro Tagliati wrote in unforgettable prose that, quote, Bordiga is now living in Italy as a Trotskyist, Trotskyist skunk, protected by the police and by fascists, and hated by workers in the way that a traitor has to be hated, end quote. Actually, Bordiga was expelled from the professional register of engineers by the fascist and can therefore not run his own firm. From 1929 to the end of the 1960s, he lived modestly, practicing his profession, quote, with great civil courage and technical competence, end quote, exposing the, quote, disastrous Neapolitan urbanistic policy, end quote. Uh, Jerosa, 2006. Bordiga had already quit political activity by the time of his expulsion from the PCI. He would live in voluntary seclusion until the end of 1944, turning down Karl Korsch's invitation to coordinate with other left-wing communists across Europe, as well as all invitations to leave Italy. Nor would he remotely join in the political work of his comrades from the left, who had fled to France? Who had fled to France and Belgium, and had founded the group called the Fraction, and the journals Prometeo, Prometeo, and Bilan. At first, Bordiga believed there was a chance to get the international back on track, which meant writing. But then he persuaded himself that a historic defeat had occurred which required much meditation. This was not without consequences. Bordiga's separation from both the proletarian movement and the sparse groups challenging Stalinist and social democratic hegemony seriously affected the political organizational work he eventually resumed in the second post-war period. <laughs> Compared with the years 1911 to 1926, a much wider gap appeared between theory and organizational work as well as between program and political intervention. The weakness of the theoretical work Bordiga did in the post-war period lies in the very conception of the class-party relationship. The party acquired such a dominant and equally abstract role, in fact, 
that the reality of class just disappeared. According to Bordiga, for instance, quote, the party is the only remaining actual organ that defines the class, fights for the class, will rule for the sake of the class in due course, and sets up the end of all governments and classes, end quote. Bordiga, uh, 1953. As though the party was a demiurge that molds the class and the revolutionary process. However, the forced isolation from industrial proletarians, the communist left of Italy, had to suffer. Excuse me. However, <laughs> however, the forced isolation from industrial proletarians, the Italian communist left had to suffer after World War II, may well account for Bordiga's views on the party. Meanwhile, the Communist Party, now Partito Comunista Italiano, PCI, I don't know what the relevance of the name changed, the, the, uh, before it was uh, PC Dei, which was what, how it was spelled, I was just saying PCI, so I don't know if the PC Dei or PCI are necessarily different or just different names for the same party. Any hooser. Meanwhile, the Communist Party was becoming the mass party of the Italian working class. But as Tagliati put it in 1944, the, quote, new party was now conceived of as a, quote, national Italian party, end quote, that had to deal with the, quote, problem of emancipation of labor within the frame of our national freedom and life, end quote, in order to make the, quote, salvation, the resurrection of Italy, end quote, come true. The reformist and socio-nationalist party scrupulously thwarted all attempts to spread revolutionary Marxism among the workers' movement. The PCI succeeded in that endeavor despite the PCI succeeded in that endeavor quite easily because of the general improvement in workers' living conditions and the extension of democratic rights, which, however, was also achieved thanks to workers' fights. Albeit partially and temporarily, there actually was a, quote, integration of the working masses within the democratic institutions. Bordiga's theoretical and political weaknesses does not detract from the value of the theoretical work Bordiga carried out throughout the second post-war period with the help of a few Italian and French comrades. Bruno Maffi, Giuliano Bianchini, Atterino Perona, Suzanne, Suzanne Vote, as well as Jacques Camat and Roger Dengeville during Bordiga's last years. The essence of Bordiga's work in this period lies in a fresh return to the critique of political economy. That is, a Marxist-based analysis of the evolution of contemporary capitalism, which addresses more particularly the, quote, socialist USSR and U.S. supercapitalism, the two cornerstones of the New World Order. Moreover, and at the same time, Bordiga's analysis brings into focus the distinctive traits of socialism and communism, both disfigured by the triumphant march of anti-Marxist state Marxism. Bordiga wrote about the USSR on several occasions, animated as he was by the conviction that Marxism is the theory of the counter-revolution. Sorry. Bordiga wrote about the USSR on several occasions, animated as he was by the conviction that, quote, Marxism is the theory of the counter-revolution, end quote. In other terms, Marxism is able to unravel the mystery of a revolution that got crumpled up and eventually vanished. 
Bordiga's research went beyond individual actors, specific Russian laws and institutions, and the ideological expressions of the counter-revolution. In Bordiga's view, a, quote, double revolution occurred in 1917, Russia. The nature of its state capitalism is essentially capitalist, not socialist. The socioeconomic structure of Stalin's Russia is that of the, quote, state capitalism mixed with private enterprise, whereas the latter develops by lessening the former, end quote. The complex Kolkhoz system prevailed in the countryside, prevailing in the countryside, ultimately is a, quote, sub-bourgeois formula, end quote, as production units are still, quote, welded to the institution of the family rather than actually planning things, quote, Soviet-type economic planning, end quote, just records what has already happened, and it has nothing to do with socialism because it relies on capitalist criteria like wages and profits, money, and monetary accounting. Bordiga's conclusion clearly echoes Marx's line of reasoning. One should not confuse capitalism with private property and the means of production. There may not be private property or just a little of private property. However, we do not get anywhere near to socialism when the production of goods and, and the reproduction of society embody the logic of the market, the wage relation, and corporation. Quote, the beast is the enterprise, not the fact that someone owns it, end quote. This is Bordiga's razor-sharp metaphor. Nor is socialism anywhere to be seen when dead labor dominates living labor, with a network of capitalist interest in groups operating within the country and tightening links with global market powers. All this has nothing to do with, quote, popular socialism. This is about developing capitalism in Russia instead and tackling its trend towards stagnation. Sooner or later, the protagonist would confess all. Sooner or later, the protagonists would confess all. As for the U.S., quote, world superpower, end quote, Bordiga carried out a well-documented and caustic analysis of that, quote, plutocratic monster that keeps under its classic iron heel our proletarian comrades, end quote. Bordiga destroyed the image popular after 1945 of the U.S. as the, quote, hope for humanity, end quote, and the land of, quote, people's capitalism, end quote. Bordiga anticipated where capitalism was actually going. The more capitalism becomes parasitic, Bordiga points out, the faster capitalism, quote, shifts from productive techniques to speculative maneuvers, end quote. The U.S. is the emblem of this process. Armed with its massive money supply, the super dollar and the monopoly of capitalism, capital, monopoly of capital, the U.S. conquers the world, including Europe, roughly hidden beneath a facade of, quote, democratic issues, end quote, pacifism and calls for freedom are the, quote, imperial programs of the most devastating militarism ever, a true monster state. This is what Bordiga called, calls the new, quote, financial thermonuclear imperialism, end quote. The new imperialism, Bordiga argued, will not necessarily affect mass consumption, but will fail to narrow the, quote, income inequality gap between metropolises and colonial and vassal states, as well as between advanced industrial areas and backward agrarian areas, or those of primordial agriculture, end quote. Furthermore, end quote, above all, end quote, it would not be able to tackle the inequality gap, quote, between social classes of the same country, including the one where the prince of imperial capitalism raises its slave-dealing banner, end quote. In other words, the U.S. will not be able to eradicate any of their own historical scourges, starting with the condition of African Americans. <laughs>
looking forward. Bordiga thus gave a sharp portrait of the two universal models of capitalism peacefully competing with each other on the world stage while fruitlessly struggling with their insoluble internal antagonisms. In the post-war period, Bordiga also turned to the awakening of the peoples of the global south. Bordiga had overlooked it in the 1920s, but in the early 1960s he wrote, quote, Perhaps the whirlwind march of our yellow and black brothers, which keeps increasing in pace and intensity, will make up for the half-century we have lost, end quote. This theoretical and historical research pursued tirelessly by Dort Bordiga led him to envision, envisage that a revolutionary scenario would unfold as early as the mid-1970s. Bordiga accordingly laid out a topical set of immediate revolutionary measures to be imposed in Western countries, involving reducing the share taken by investment goods in the total product and cutting overall production, quote, raising the cost of production, end quote, in order to pay higher wages for less labor time, cutting the working day by at least half in order to absorb unemployment and antisocial activities, quote, authoritarian control of consumption, end quote, to combat advertising and consumerism, replacing commodified social security with support for non-workers, shifting construction in order to spread homes and workplaces more evenly across the countryside, attacking professional specialization, and subordinating education and the media to the communist state. Happily contrasting with his own self-portrait as a mere imitator of Marx, fighting all innovator, innovators, Bordiga sketched out an up-to-date revolutionary program. This is a program for our times unless, quote, the common ruin of the contending classes, end quote, occurs. Notwithstanding his theoretical and political weaknesses, Amadeo Bordiga, Bordiga, Amadeo Bordiga, will be center stage in a still-to-come genuine history of the communist movement. Few Marxists have understood so deeply the international nature of both the proletarian revolution and the way to socialism. Even fewer realize so soon that Stalinism was leading to a complete deteriorate distortion of the strategy and program of the international. Almost no one has probably been able to depict, almost no one has probably been able to depict so vividly the distinctive characteristics of the socialist and communist society. In addition, at a time when the, quote, U.S. model was at its peak, Bordiga unveiled the horrid traits of the new imperialism and the inherent link between democracy and militarism. Meanwhile, opposing, quote, socialist productivism, he showed as early as the 1950s that Marx's and Marxist critique of political economy is from the outset an ecological critique of capitalism, as it brings into question nature's and the species' relation to capital, and not just the capital-wage-labor relation. Some historians have argued that Bordiga saw better far than near. If this is the case, then we should regard him as a revolutionary explorer of the 21st century.